we arrived just as there was an air raid on Rangoon, one of the first air raids on Rangoon. We got off the boat. I think we unloaded ourselves. We had got some mules coming, 50 of them, and they very cleverly loaded the mules on one ship and the mule holders, the chaps that looked after the mules, on another ship. I think we got the mules first. And they were pretty restive running round and round the docks with nobody to look after them because the other ship hadn't arrived. We'd hit the Jap so hard that the Japanese command was sitting down wondering what to do next. The only sound method of communication we had from one unit to another or from headquarters to the fighting units was by civil telephone. Our 18 sets that we had from the frontier wouldn't work in the jungle. And until the tanks came in from the desert with radios that worked, we had really no radio contact. We now know the Jap intercepted a message on the telephone from headquarters telling our division to withdraw with the utmost speed to the line of the Satung River, which was about 12 miles behind us. The Jap heard that and he lit off as fast as he could for the Satung Bridge and as we came in onto that bridge, jam-packed, transport, everything out on the road, he came down from both sides and cut us to pieces. We couldn't hold the bridge any longer. That's where the bridge was blown up. We must at that stage have lost more than half the division. We did get survivors back. A lot of them were naked and no shoes. It was an absolute disaster. After a quiet night, we were bombarded again the next day by when we were near the Sitang. We were told 16th Brigade would help us from over the river, but the bridge was blown before that happened. We felt we would die there as we had been defeated. All was ruined, and how many dead there were. We met floors from what we could, but the Japanese aircraft were flying up and down, shooting those trying to cross. The group I was with received orders to try and make our own way back to Mekthila, Mondale or Rangoon, whichever was the easiest to reach and to throw away our weapons. But I kept hold of mine. We looked up and down the river and saw the enemy firing all around. We kept quiet moving from place to place as best we could. We went back to the river but could not cross it. So we went back to hide in the jungle. The Japanese were everywhere. By then, there were five of us. We hid, evaded, and retreated. Next morning, we were very hungry as we had no rations. As we had a bit of money, we went to a barmaid's house and said we would buy some food from them. But they would not sell us any, saying they had none. As we were so hungry, we decided we had to break into a house and see what we could get. Two men went and came back with a pot of cooked rice. As we were scoping out handfuls and eating, a Japanese officer and three soldiers with bayonets fixed to their rifles came upon us and shouted to us to put our hands up. The Burmese we had asked for ration must have told the Japanese of our presence. We were on the move all day, no food and no water, walking through rubber streets. We were taken to a wide of piece of land where many of battalion were, British officers as well. So you have come to join us one axe. We thought you had escaped. We tried to but could not. Now hunger will kill us, I replied. He said the Japanese give us a handful of rice about as much as we feed the chickens with. We have been here for days. At 1700 hours, the Japanese brought four of the vehicles we had put out of action, shouting at us in a loud voice. We were pushed inside, packed tighter than a load of goods, and the sentries were placed. As we drove off into the night, we passed groups of Japanese soldiers and the sentries shouted out that the enemy soldier had been captured. One night at 2100 hours, we reached the bank of the Irrawaddy and stayed near a bamboo clump. 
We were told that we would cross at 0800 next morning and to keep quiet. No coughing, no smoking except under cover because the Japanese were on the far side. Next morning, we loaded our heavy weapons on mules and horses and half sea company moved upstream. As we moved out, bomb started falling, groom key, groom, groom key, groom, and small arms fire, parara, 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 came from the far bank. Non-stop it came, parara, 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 and hit the bamboo and undergrowth, trim, 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 chuya, chuya, chuya. Toy C Company, Subedar Sri Bhakta, his early and myself fell to the ground and many of the company were killed. Havildar Hari Singh, the platoon Havildar, was hiding somewhere else. Some men scattered and went where I knew not. Many animals were killed, many including the one elephant ran away. Ha ha hoo hoo. The Japanese pinned us down and we could not fire back. The OC sub shouted, Hari Singh Havildar. Where are the three inch motorman? Are they there? Yes, yes, he shouted back. The OC told him to fire the motors, but I shouted back the numbers one and four were dead. I am by myself. Number two is somewhere with the animals. We told ourselves we had to fire back and we tried to, but we could not lift our head. Bullets zinged all around us. Sri Bhaktas early stood up and was immediately shot. His body fell on top of us, covering us in blood, he babbling as he died. The bullets fell around us like hailstones. Our ammunition was with us but the motors were on mules which were dead or scattered. Which one of us remaining three was to face them. As I would have to die one day, why not now? I pulled a motor, bipod, base plate and ammunition from a dead mule and went into action. The OC sub shouted, fire on the line of 11 o'clock with a range of 500 yards. I fired one round, then thought of our men being in the area, so fired another at 700 yards. Even heavier fire came from the Japanese. On and on the bullets came, and the OC sub shouted, a little right, 12 o'clock. I fired by myself as the other were still hiding. The second bomb hit the Japanese position and they stopped firing. And then our fire opened. Bhututu, bhututu, bhututu. The OC sub shouted, stop. So I stopped. Then other motor section also stopped firing. Our wounded men were groaning. We collected as many weapons as possible from the dead man and the dead animal and buried them in a pit. We also buried the dead. It took us three days to cross the river and we gave a lot of covering fire. I crossed over last of all. In February 1944, seven divisions that included us were besieged in the admin box with the Japanese all around us. Always from 1800 to 1900 hours, we were hit by artillery. It was big heavy stuff. Then from 1900 hours, the Japanese would charge us, shouting for us to surrender and scattering leaflets into our perimeter positions. Our orders were not to open fire until the perimeter had been breached. We never shouted back at them. On the 7th or 8th of March 1944, we were ordered into our bunkers as 5, 20, 23, 25 and 26 divisions tried to break the blockade with their artillery from 1800 till 1900 hours. We were deafened. At 0630 hours, the fighters strafed the Japanese positions for half an hour, then the bombers came over for two hours. We broke out and saw tanks and carriers like a flock of sheep. The Japanese had run away and we saw very few dead ones. After we were relieved, we were allowed to rest near a river for a week. We were covered with lice as none of us had washed for about six weeks. Rations had been sought, so they were conserved because no one knew how long we could hold out. We had one spoonful of rice in the mornings and one chapati in the evenings. We had also run out of cigarettes. Early next morning the Japanese attacked and drove us back all the way to Manipur. We climbed wireless hill and saw a Japanese flag tied to a small tree. 
A company was sent in front of us and I asked the subedar if he had seen the flag. No, he had not. I pointed it out to him and told him to take care. A bit later, the Japanese opened fire and killed an A Company brain gunner. The OC who loved his men went forward to the dead man and was himself killed. A and B companies retreated. It was now our turn to go ahead to see if we could capture the flag. In that area, there were lots of ditches where tapioca had been planted. We moved along those ditches and reached the tree where the flag was. The ground was very slippery. One man stood at the base of the tree, another on his shoulders and a third on the shoulders of the second. The fourth had started to climb up but we collapsed as the weight was so heavy. The enemy heard the noise and came to see what was what. We ran away and hid in the tapioca ditch. At 0400 hours we returned to the company. Hotsford Saib said, I sent you to get the flak because you said you could get it but you didn't. I want a saw, I said, and Hosford Sahib ordered one from the Pioneer platoon. After our evening meal, I thought I was a survivor, so I decided to go and get the flag with the same four men. Off we went, very slowly, keeping in cover as we went. We came across two deep trenches at the base of Wireless Hill. At midnight, all was quiet and we started to saw the base of the tree. The Japanese shouted at us, so we slipped back to the tapioca trenches. We talked about what to do next. We decided to go back to the flag as all was quiet and by 0300 hours we had cut the tree. As we were lowering it with our hands above our heads, six Japanese armed with swords suddenly descended on us. The rear three men ran away and I was left with the flag in my hands. The Japanese put their swords on the ground and tried to pull the flag from me. Six of them and one of me pulling, pulling, pulling me uphill towards their position. If I were to call my men, the other Japanese would hear from the top and come and help the others. I drew my cookery and tried to cut the rope, which the Japanese were holding onto. But I cut the flag and ran away with my bit of it. I took it to Hosford Saif, who was very surprised, and I explained how it all happened. Our wireless mule fell and our set was broken so the CEO decided to turn back. But two Japanese supply vehicles came along the road, saw us and hid, then made a loud noise with their engines. The CEO shouted, double march and the column split with one lot going forward and the other lot going back. A Gorkha Lance Havalda mule leader was shot in the left thigh and I bandaged him up with my first field racing. 95 of our men became involved in a Japanese attack. The wounded man was in great pain. The 95 men rejoined the CO and on the way burned the two Japanese trucks. I was stuck with the Lance Havalda who said he could not move. I buried his tummy gun and carried his magazines and him also. I met up with five men and we each thought the other were Japanese. But luckily, we didn't open fire but ran away in opposite direction. They ran away downhill to the rice field at the edge of the jungle. Some time later, the moon rose and I saw the five men at the bottom of a small hillock. I put the wounded man down and rested. I saw the banners of the five glinting as they came towards us and I thought they were enemy. They aimed at us from a standing position. I gave the password, Ago, fire, and they correctly answered, Kursani, Chili. We joined up together, but we were separated from all the others. I had a cloth mat and a compass. The wounded man said, let's go back to India. How could we do that over big rivers like the Irrawaddy and the Chinwin? Impossible. I said, we ought to rejoin the battalion. By then, the other five had started to move away as they didn't want to try and rejoin it. So I started with the wounded man who could walk slowly. A bit later, the other five came back to us as they had no map or compass. I ordered two to go in front, two behind and one either side of the wounded man. But nobody agreed to go in front. I went in front and at one bridge saw 70 Japanese. Some were cooking and others were bathing. All their arms were stacked. They didn't see us. 
I decided not to fire at them so as not to give away our position. I gave a hand signal to move to a flank. We moved through jungle uphill and spent the rest of the night there. Next day, I planned our movement on the map and moved off. We moved down to another small stream and found some Japanese saving using a large Burmese mirror. None saw us. We moved off and eventually recognized the Lancaster Fusiliers in a wired position with their weapons ready to shoot down aeroplanes. The first first Gorka rifles job, along with the brigade and the division, was to disarm the Japanese. The surrender terms were, and I read, all Japanese forces in French Indochina have been ordered to fly a black flag denoting surrender. That edict made a great impression on me, as indeed did the rules of conduct laid down for our relations with the surrendered Japanese forces. The orders were, there will be no fraternizing whatever between Japanese and Allied forces. In dealing with Japanese, your behavior will be guarded and coldly polite. You will, in the case of senior Japanese officers, use their correct title. You will not shake hands with them. In no case will British and Japanese officers feed in the same room, nor will tea be offered at any meeting. Any Japanese who come to receive orders or report should be kept at arm's length, that is, with a table between you and them, and they should not be allowed to sit at the same table. Yamagishi Butai had to surrender. Officers their swords and the other ranks, their sidearms and rifles. The Yamagishi Butai, Butai Battalion, and Yamagishi, the name of the commanding officer, was one of the two battalions not involved in any nastiness during the war. The parade ground where we had this ceremony was in the middle of some French barracks. We arranged it that the Japanese battalion would form up facing some tables behind which our Gurkha officers would sit, behind them British officers would stand, and behind that the British flag. So this was a surrender Asian to Asian. The Yamagishi came up with his second best sword, having given me his first best sword three days earlier. Yamagishi's first and best sword was 250 years old, and it had five nicks in the blade from fighting the enemy. The interpreter said to me, Respected sir, Captain Yamagishi says he wants to give you his sword because you are a true gentleman and cavalier. And I stammered my thanks, feeling that anything I said was superfluous. Yamagishi went in front, up to the table where the Gorkha officers were, and laid his sword and saluted, did an about turn, and went back to the middle of the battalion which was in line. And then one by one the officers did the same. I'm told that when Yamagishi gave his sword in, and well at others, they had tears in their eyes. And then, on the order, ground arms, the Japanese soldiers bent over and laid their rifles at their feet. And then another order was given to take off their belt, which had their bayonet, side arms on it. Close order march, right turn, and they marched off, wearily slouching in disgrace. And it was ironic that the Japanese soldiers had their swords returned to them ten days later to cut the grass at the edge of the road that led down to Saigon to stop that area being used to ambush our vehicles. As we advanced, we heard that the Japanese had surrendered. We were sent to Saigon, where we collected Japanese prisoner of war and acted as sentries to them. I was then detailed to go to England before I went on leave to a victory parade. I shook hands with the king and queen and their daughters, the princesses. Happy, very good, that made all our wartime dukkha worthwhile. We were shown around the place by veterans of the first war, shown their weapons and photographs. I knew no English, 
but seven or eight of the men who did all from Darzling were taken away by the English Memsafs and never came back. The Memsafs loved us and one Gurkha had a queue of ten of them waiting for him. England was wonderful, good food, water in taps, hot water for washing. We were taken around the London parks and all of this for free.